disruptors and curious minds, CEOs, professionals, founders, heretics, revolutionaries, time travelers from the future or from the past. Welcome to Thinking on Paper. This is Book Club and we are on a new book, The Order of Time by Carlo Rovelli. And this one's a mind bender, a real mind bender. Before we get into it, a bit of a disclaimer. I am not a scientist. Jeremy is not <laughs> a physicist. If I like you're to pretend to be one. I like <laughs> yeah. to enjoy pretending to be one. We are not quantum scientists. If you are studying for exams, if you are doing anything where you actually have to study quantum, the quantum realm, don't quote anything you hear on today's book club, please. And on that note, Jeremy, the order of time. What alt what altitude are you at right now, Mark? Like, well, do you know what? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, do I look older than you. I yeah. know. No, you look younger than me because I got this gnarly gray beard that that's sitting here. But uh, I, all right. So yeah, let's. Yeah, just... but time passes faster in the mountains. Time passes faster in the mountains and slower at sea level, right? Yes. And the 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 one the one thing that and faster in your head and slower at your feet like yes. think about that that was another <laughs> thing i was like what in the world well the thing that we have to remember the thing that i have to remember and we've talked about it a bunch time is an invented construct by humans right and you know universal, this is the proof <laughs> this is the proof right in universal coordinated time or utc right i i actually read a long time ago and i'm not sure if this information is still accurate but time is coordinated in a database like on a spreadsheet right it's like someone someone is is basically pulling all the times together to like organize it so it's like i don't know it's it, it's it, it seems even more invented when you when you think about it from that perspective but the first question i think it was the first page yeah but the... like for what you said though like yeah it like the, the time zones were invented but at least we thought that time existed but apparently time doesn't necessarily exist at least not how we or most of us imagine it this really this we were talking about this right before we jumped on and and the the reading this like it literally made my brain feel funny like i was i was sitting out and I, I love books like that like i look for that sensation when i'm reading a book i know i'm into something because guess what that's my beginner mind like being activated it's uncomfortable it's weird it's you're in you're you're trying to like lean on current things that you understand while trying to take in like new information that is so opposite what you already know. Yes. Um, so I love that about it right off yeah. the bat. And, and he writes in a way that, I mean, he's still talking about the quantum realm, the theory of relativity. So, you know, it's it's still physics, but some things clicked. I mean, it, it, he, he uses analogies. He's, he, they, they call him the poet of physics. Like it does begin to make sense. And I hope by the end of the book, um, I, I kind of, I'm not, I've not gone insane from trying to think about this but um let's just say so the book is divided into three parts okay um he says himself in the first i summarize what modern physics has understood about time it's like holding a snowflake in your hands gradually as you study it it melts between your fingers and vanishes okay part one so he he explains how, where physics is on time at the moment the second part of the book describes what has been left with and he calls it an empty, windswept landscape, almost devoid of all trace of temporality. A strange, alien world, which is nevertheless still the one to which we belong. So, yeah, a world without time. And then the third part is kind of the philosophy of, of what it all means. Well, and then, and then we think about, like, think about the idea of, like, being um, being locked into the time directed world right you know with our business perspectives and our business endeavors we have to be able to coordinate to meet like we're meeting right now we had to coordinate at a time to sit down and meet but then we're also trying our best or at least i am trying my best to to punch out of the time organized world when i'm when i'm writing when i'm when i'm processing something when i'm reading i try you know it's almost like that flow state where time goes yeah. away so it's it's this interesting thing to to think about this stuff. One one place I'd like to start is is with Einstein, you know, which yep. which is is great. And and he talks about this. Uh, he imagines like Einstein before he created some of his theories. He started asking questions, right? Because great questions 
always lead to even better questions and they lead to amazing discoveries, right? This curious mind. And, you know, he started saying, and I'm, I'm just looking at some of my notes, how can the sun and earth attract each other without touching and without utilizing anything in between? And this is what started him thinking on the idea that, that time and space time is kind of a thing, right? So modifying the space between something. So the earth and the sun are modifying the space in between themselves and mass slows down time. Yes, that's the yeah, that's the first part of it, isn't it? That mass slows down time, which means that when you asked at the beginning if I live in the mountains, even though it's very tiny, the the higher you are, the faster time moves. So when you living on the flatland, time passes slower for you. Time passes slower for a clock on the floor than a clock on the table. Right. Right. Mind blowing, and, dude. And then, and then you extrapolate that out. Then um, one of the things that clicked for me, and it, I'm going I'm to prove that it didn't really click for me, was Einstein and this theory of relativity and this use of, if I get this correct, kind of proper time. So when when physicists are, are measuring, they're using the time in that particular space or place. And the theory of relativity, <laughs> which one of them, there's two, kind of like the idea of time being relative is that relative to where it is being measured. And, and, and the way he describes that kind of clicked for me. Time's moving differently wherever you are. That's yeah. pretty strange, isn't it? Like wherever you are, your time is moving different to any other point. Uh, yeah. And, and what it is in, in the, the essence of reality is like all of these interwoven individual proper times yes. are, are kind of, we come in and out of those, right? So you and I are experiencing something in what we deem to be the present, but my present is different than your present because you're where you are and I'm where I am. And it, it, I think this was, this was in a, in an upcoming chapter, maybe we can get to that. It, this may be in three, but I, the idea that, um, that time that you can like, what, what, what is Mark doing right now? I'm thinking in my little box, my little square here, what's Mark thinking right now, but it's, it's what's Mark doing in my time right now, yeah. which is not possible because you're in your proper time. Yeah. And there's this loss of unity. Like that, that's the first kind of block that he takes out of the, the tower of time babble or whatever. And that, you know, to start the crumbling of time is that there is no unity of time. There is no single time. And, um, but there are not just two times. Times are legion, a different one for every point in space. There is not one single time. There is a vast multitude of them. The time indicated by a particular clock measuring a particular phenomenon is called proper time in physics. Every clock has its proper time. Every phenomenon that occurs has its proper time, its own rhythm. And then Einstein has given us the equations because thank you, Einstein. Right. Um, yeah. No unity. And I don't know about you, but this one, no unity. Okay. I could. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's weird, but I could get it. There's a, a, an infinite amount of times, depends on where you are, altitude, mass changes, the speed of the time. Okay. But the second part was the the loss of direction. <laughs> that one was like, okay, time flows. No, it doesn't. <laughs> oh, from like the, the arrow of time measured by entropy and all that. Let's let me let me before we jump into that, because I think that's chapter two. The one thing in chapter one that I thought was super interesting that helped me set and be comfortable with new perspectives, because this is a new perspective. Again, we talked about getting back to that beginner's mind when something is so new, so fresh, so counter to what you think. So the sunset analogy, right? Yeah. So if you're watching, if I'm sitting outside and actually I'm I'm super I mean, my views aren't as cool as yours, uh, obviously, but I could step out my driveway and the sun sets right to the left up the hill. And it's actually pretty beautiful for kind of a residential neighborhood. And as you're looking and you see the sun disappear down the sky, we're actually just spinning away from the sun. Yeah. And that like clicked. Him. I was like, whoa, yeah. Like the sun. I know the sun doesn't drop down the horizon, but like to really think about the orb that we sit on is moving this direction which is causing the sun <laughs> to drop. Yeah. That was really cool to me. 
was, was, it was that Cop- Copernicus who first, you know, said like like Einstein proved this without actually being able to measure it. Copernicus was the one who theorized that this was happening without it actually being measured. Yeah, I like the beginner's mind. Um. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 if we look at chapter two, because I know we wanted to try and cover chapter one and yeah. chapter two today. If we look at chapter two, you mentioned loss of direction, right? So think this, this kind of blew my mind, right? Yeah. The yeah. link between time and heat is fundamental. Every time there's a difference manifested between the past and the present, heat is always involved. And then we think about what heat is. Heat is the microscopic agitation of molecules, right? So if you look at a glass of water, right? And I think this is part of, if you look at a glass of water, it looks like super calm. It's still, mm-hmm. right? But that glass of water, those molecules are agitated. We just can't perceive the agitation because it's so small. Yep. And that's where we get to this idea of the past and the present and yep. the future is our perception of these blurred agitations of molecules. We can't see them all, right? So he thinks if we can see them all, like if we could see all the microscopic agitations of all the molecules in all of what is reality, could we see the future like we see the present? And I was like, yo, like, <laughs> holy, right? Yeah, it was it was pretty, pretty special, wasn't it? They were um, the, the idea. Of, so heat. So heat only moves from um, cold. Well, well, how can it move from cold to heat? Like. He is the only basic law of physics that distinguishes the past from the future. None of the others do so. Not Newton's laws governing the mechanics of the world. Not the equations for electricity and magnetism formulated by Maxwell. Not Einstein's on relativic, relativistic gravity. Nor those of quantum mechanics devised by Heisenberg, Schrodinger and Dirac. The only one is this idea of the transfer of heat. And the transfer of heat is entropy. And that is every single molecule atom in existence is actually a transfer of heat which like and, and this is where i started to lose the thread so like it's, 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 heat is time like that it, what no uh, uh, a a difference in times a difference in past and present results in the output of heat so the heat heat is a result between the difference of time as i as i like and again, I'm still. The, oh yeah, you, okay. Only where there is heat is there a distinction between past and future. P.S. Disruptors and curious minds, you're watching immediate internal processing of very complex yeah. stuff coming out of this book. So we're, but we're okay with it. We're okay yeah. looking a little bit silly. This is great. So if there's no heat, then there's no time. So like you know, if you go back to the the beginning of the Big Bang, before the Big Bang, there was no heat, there was no time. So what was before the Big Bang? There was there was there was nothing because you don't have anything unless you have heat, and there was no heat. So vis a vis, no time. So the <laughs> clock starts then. The clock starts then, right? What about what about this idea of? And this is goes back to what I said a little bit earlier. Um, he phrases it, and and the way he writes, Ravelli writes, is awesome. Like yes. it's, it totally pulls you in, just like a. Uh, a brilliant narrative, right? Yeah. Not a very, not scientific, you know, not dry and scientific. Um, yeah. But he talks about like the universe being blurred and approximate. So I started thinking, and we've been digging into quantum a lot, you know, on thinking on paper and, and just us, you know, diving into that in general. But quantum, you know, really small things are driven by probabilities, right? The probabilities of these chance interactions um, and the approximate like what i got from blurred is all right there's all of these things happening some of some of which a lot of which we can't see and what our brain likes to do is approximate things right it it kind of gathers like we when we look and we see like i'm seeing you i'm seeing me i'm seeing the room but that is just you know light reflecting off of things that my brain is now telling me this is the approximation i'm in a room i'm talking to mark i'm this i'm that but what all the other approximations that I, I can't see or the things that feed the approximation. Like, yo, this is, yeah. The deep. <laughs> Can you see the steam like firing out of my head here? Um, <laughs> well, um, what's this one? Um, there's the story of um, 
um, what was his name? Ludwig Boltzmann, which I won't go into, that people should read up. Well, just buy the book because it's amazing. And then you can read about Leopold yourself. Um, if we think about it carefully, every configuration is particular. Every configuration is singular. If we look at all of its details, since every configuration always has something about it that characterizes it in a unique way. I don't know what that means, but I highlighted it. <laughs> <laughs> Say that one more time. Let's see if we can unpack it. Um, if we, so I think it's kind of connected to your, your, what you were talking about, the blurring. He talks about the blurring um, of reality. Mm -hmm. And if we think about it carefully, every configuration is particular. Every configuration is singular. If we look at all of its details, since every configuration always has something about it that characterizes it in a, new, in a unique way. Um, entropy. The, the, I take that. Okay. I, why did I highlight that? It's connected to entropy, isn't it? And where entropy is the the passage of heat from cold to hot, the dismantling of the what came before it. If everything is individual, unique, every I'm going to leave it there. I don't know. Well, no, that goes Lambling. back to so. So you're saying particular, right? So we talked about proper time and phenomenons that are happening in a space measure in a space measured by a particular device right so in your room you're you know you're the phenomenon being measured there's a particular time related to your phenomenon a particular perception of reality that you're seeing in these approximations and the same thing the same thing on my side um but but what I, i'm looking at you know Bolzmann talking about entropy and and you know basically he paraphrases Bolzmann saying that entropy is nothing other then the number of microscopic states that our blurred vision of the world fails to distinguish. So those that's those are the pieces that we can't perceive, that we are gathering small bits of to approximate, which is which is crazy. Which, which is all to say that that is entropy is time's arrow. That that movement of heat from cold to hot. That entrop entrop entropy of the every molecule and every atom is essentially time's arrow. Yeah, the equation for time zero, delta S is greater than or equal to zero. Delta S is the change in entropy, right? So there's actually an equation related to the passage of time moving from past to present. And past is lower entropy because it's more perceivable, right? We've already seen it, we've already done it. We don't necessarily have to approximate it anymore. We have a memory of it, right? But as we move to the present, entropy increases and we have uh, we have to approximate things because there's a lot of signals, some of which we don't perceive, some of which we do, the ones we perceive give us our set of reality. As we move to the future, entropy increases even more so and the things we're able to perceive and our mind is tuned to be able to perceive is is very limited right so that's what we were talking about earlier if we were able to sense all the little things moving around all the time the future could potentially be as uh perceivable as the past and on that note we will see you in the future um this is why we're doing book club okay we, we've done other books we've done we did clear thinking by shane parish and we did the design of everyday things and we've changed tact with this book um and i think that our <laughs> i don't want to say our ignorance but our lack of knowledge is going to come to the fore here and this is why we're doing this so we can try to understand this book in a in a more cohesive deeper way so we'll see you next week for the next part of the order of time by carlo Rivelli. any final thoughts jeremy Man, this is helping me, uh, helping me. If I was reading this by myself, it would be a very different journey than reading it with you, Mark. So folks, pick up this book, jump into this with us. Hey, send us a note. We'll pull you into one of these boxes and you will be joining us via your proper time, measured by your device, measuring you as a phenomenon. And we'll pull you into ours and we'll see what happens. And yeah, let, let the entropy begin. Till next time. Stay curious. The whole nine. Be disruptive. Keep thinking on